pleasure to have us, uh, our special colloquium lecturer today, one of the delegates this year, Dr. Eric Keller from Harvard University. Title: The Solid State Prosecutor's Right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, for coming today. And uh, this is the technical talk, uh, something we've been working on for six or nine months. Uh, I think it, it's already becoming controversial and will become controversial because of the practitioners of the uh, an opposite way of looking at, a different way of looking at things, which has uh, been long since a part of solid state spectroscopy. So we've been pinching ourselves and doing everything we can to make sure that we're not crackpots or, or wrong. And, uh, one thing which convinced us that we are on the right track is that we solved a 35-year-old mystery of the spectroscopy of polyacetylene, which uh, had never been, uh, you, know, you know how infamous polyacetylene was. I like to say it was the, the first graphene because it played all the same roles. I mean, people wanted, there were Nobel Prizes associated with it uh, for making and understanding it. Uh, people tried to understand it as spectroscopy, but it was uh, problematic. But their main hope was for a organic uh, conductor. And uh, uh, it was filled the journals. Uh, it was the source of the Sue Schrieffer Heger uh, soliton model. And uh, I did check, and there weren't as many papers on polyacetylene as there are now on graphene. but. That what you would expect because of the growth of the number of scientists has been exponential since the early 80s. And um, so actually it surprised us that the polyacetylene problem had not been addressed by the people who had purported for the last 12 years to have solved the graphene spectroscopy problem. Um, uh, and uh, the focus by that community is only on graphene, carbon nanotubes, and to some extent graphite. And uh, if it's a powerful way to do Raman spectroscopy, then we, we thought, good, we'll, uh, we'll apply it to polyacetylene. Now my background in my earliest days as an assistant professor was Raman spectroscopy. And uh, I'd, it's been a long absence, but uh, and I hadn't done any real solid state Raman. But uh, when I saw the explanations given by this community, I found it had very little to do with what I knew Raman scattering to be. And uh, I began to suspect because, after all, graphene is just a, you know, you can start with a molecule and just keep building up, and then you have a graphene sheet. There, there ought to be no discontinuity in description. So uh, we grew suspicious and began to, to look into this. But the danger f for us is that Mildred Russell House and 1,200 people are embedded in this other description now for, for 12 or 14 years. And it is uh, not compatible with what I'm going to tell you today. And uh, so uh, actually, since this is so early on, I'd love to hear your questions even during a talk because this is the kind of thing we're going to, uh, whether your, your thoughts are correct or not, it's the kind of, it's practice for us in dealing with this, what will be a socially difficult situation. I've never been in a situation like this. Uh, done lots of things I'm proud of, but uh, we didn't set out to, to be diametrically opposed to so many other people working in the field, but it just happened that way. So I'm going to start with a, a review of Raman scattering um, and uh, then tell you about this polyacetylene uh, solution and then move on to graphene. Uh, and this theory is called the double resonance theory. If you Google scholar, now not just plain Google, 
Uh, you'll get many more things if you do that. But if you Google Scholar graphene, nanotubes, graphite, and double resonance theory, you'll get 6,000 papers on Google. So um, this is, I should tell you that uh, many of those papers say, I think accurately, that Raman scattering is one of the most important uh, techniques used on graphene, used in conjunction with graphene for two reasons. One is uh, it's been shown to be very characteristic of the state of the graphene. Is it a single layer, is it a double layer, is it twisted? Uh, there's all these Raman signatures that uh, I don't certainly take issue with. They're experimental, um, depending upon the state of the graphene. And then there's also the electronic structure. Uh, Raman scattering tells you a great deal about electronic structure and phonon structure, and uh, uh, that's what needs to be understood uh, as best we can to uh, learn about the physics of graphene by this spectroscopy. Um, absorption spectroscopy is completely dull for graphene, it's basically flat. Um, so uh, you know, what spectroscopy do you want to use? Well, there are others, uh, neutrons, uh, electron scattering, and they have been used, especially to get phonon spectra. But uh, Raman remains the main uh, spectroscopy used with graphene. Uh, okay, so uh, let's get around to this first uh, subject. And I'm going to start with some terminology and some conceptual troubles that I've encountered over the years. It, just a, a question of terminology that's sort of slipping. Uh, one paper slips and kind of uses the wrong definition, and the next paper, re, uh, the guys read it, and they use the same wrong definition. <laughs> so um, the uh, it has to do with the Frank Condon approximation, uh, in which it is correctly stated that the nuclei sort of stay put while the fast electrons make a change, which sounds like Born-Oppenheimer. In fact, it is not very well known that Frank Condon is not a new um, approximation beyond Born-Oppenheimer. It's exactly equivalent to Born-Oppenheimer plus first order perturbation theory for light matter interaction. So um, in Born-Oppenheimer, we make the same statements about the nuclei being slow and the electrons uh, being fast. Um, the Condon approximation, this is where a lot of the terminology is now wrong in the literature, uh, is not the same as the Frank Condon approximation. The Condon approximation is on top of the Frank Condon theory, and it specifically means that you're neglecting the coordinate dependence of the transition dipole matrix elements which connect you from one electronic state to another. And uh, it is universally used in condensed matter theory. I don't know how that, uh, that uh, tradition got started. Um, that means you can get the magnitude right of the tendency to make the transition with the constant term. But if the term varies with phonon coordinate, it would also instantly create phonons. Because, you're mul because that term multiplies the initial wave function, the transition dipole term does. And if it depends on phonon coordinates, you have no choice but to expand those in terms of phonon modes. And if you multiply the ground state by creation operators for phonon modes, you're going to have phonons instantly. And yet, uh, it's, it's not included in the condensed matter spectroscopy. Yes? You need to include a vertex where there's a light coming in, electron volt pair, and a phonon coming out, all in one vertex. Exactly. Exactly. And I hope that'll become much clearer why um, as we go along here. Um, 
So I just want to do a quick derivation of why Kramer Heisenberg Dirac, uh, which is the uh, standard theory uh, used certainly in chemistry, in molecular spectroscopy, for Raman scattering, uh, why that's really the same as Born-Oppenheimer. Uh, Kramer's Heisenberg Dirac is Frank Kahn in theory, really, for two photons. We have Raman, you go up one and, and down one. Uh, Frank Kahnen approximation is usually thought of as in the context of absorption of one photon. Uh, so, starting with um, something extremely general there, uh, that is to say, we have a lump of matter and it's a many body system, and we, we actually don't uh, know what the initial and final state are, except that they're exact many body eigenstates, and we're going to change which one we're in by absorbing a photon, propagating under the exact Hamiltonian, and uh, emitting a photon. And uh, this is actually completely general, and we'll see it again because uh, Leon Falikoff started here. Um, and if you do just a couple of manip manipulations with second order perturbation theory, you can write the probability of going from the initial state to the final state as the half Fourier integral of, uh, this is time dependent propagation of exact, uh, well, this is no longer, if you multiply by electron coordinates, and here there is an approximation, we're assuming there's something heavy and something light, and we're just still going to use the electrons as the uh, responsive agents to light. I mean, you could include the nuclei if you wanted to. Um, but this is no longer an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian because you multiplied by the electron coordinates. So you have a job to do in propagating it with the exact Hamiltonian. And then you project onto this final state, which is also not an exact eigenstate. And it's a different uh, state G here. And you have some function of time. And if you half Fourier transform that and square it, that would be the exact probability or cross-section for going from many body state A to many body state B. But Just to, the zero in the I zero F is, we're starting out at Brunson. That, mean, that means the starting state, I'm sorry. Just, oh no, okay. just to understand. Yeah. And then when you refer to a coordinate in the last slide, is that our, our hat here, or where is that coordinate which you said you know, uh, is being neglected? Is it, can we see it in this formula? Yeah, their phonon coordinates being neglected. It's in the wavelengths. And that doesn't quite square with these first two lines of this next slide because um, we don't have phonons unless we have Born Oppenheim. So. That's the next thing I'm going to do is unabashedly pass to Born-Oppenheimer in which uh, we have wave functions, electronic wave functions, which are uh, parametric on the nuclear coordinates, which I uh, have here as C, and uh, R are the electronic coordinates. And also, we're soon going to need a Hamiltonian, which I call the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian, which will uh, create, which will have uh, H-cycles, E-psi solutions to the Born-Oppenheimer states, these states here. Uh, of course, there are corrections to the Born-Oppenheimer. Uh, I believe they're important in condensed matter physics, but uh, the theme of this talk is, let's try Born-Oppenheimer before we start making corrections and see how far we get. Heimer then is saying that we have chi, which is like representing the lattice of, of, uh, of the nuclei, and it depends on these size. I mean, which is which, you know. Yeah, so these chi's, uh, these chi's are the vibrational wave functions on a given, this is just happening in the ground state, uh, or the initial state. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, there are phonon modes. Uh, which could be totally quiescent, zero Kelvin, 
Uh, but they depend upon, all, and the dark uh, font here means all the phonon coordinates. So disk psi is the coordinate we were talking about in the last slide. Yes, it is. Yeah, so nuclear coordinates, phonon coordinates. And indeed, uh, when we're talking about coordinate dependence of the transition moment, which you will several times, we're talking about phonon coordinate dependence. Uh, so if we make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and this state goes to this canonical Born-Oppenheimer form, the perturbation remains the same. The Hamiltonian has become Born-Oppenheimer. We have something like this. And now we can start to go further. Uh, and uh, notice that for each set of, no matter where the nuclei are, if I sum over all the electronic states at that nuclear position, and that's what you do in Born-Oppenheimer. You fix the nuclei and find all the nuclei and find all the electronic states at that position. Uh, that's the unit operator. That's a complete set in the electronic coordinates. Is there, is there any, there's no controversy with, with that, right? OK. Um, so there's the same expression we had at the bottom of the last slide. And we're going to insert this unity uh, on both sides of the Born-Oppenheimer pro approximation, except what's going to happen is that Born-Oppenheimer thinks that's an eigenstate, so you'd think you'd have to have a sum over j and a sum over j prime, but that's going to remain diagonal because the Hamiltonian doesn't connect it. So uh, there's that single sum over j, and now we can start collecting these transition moments I've been talking about. Uh, they are um, the integral over the electronic degrees of freedom times the dipole operator uh, at fixed nuclear position. And it's labeled by the state you started in, the state you went to. These are electronic states. Uh, and uh, maybe you want to label it by the polarization of the radiation and so on. But uh, these are the famous transition moments. Uh, and there's a pair of them, one over here. And now here, um, this is actually going to be easy because that's an eigenstate of the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian. So um, we wind up with these uh, uh, it looks like I dropped these guys in this expression. I'm, I apologize for that. We wind up with this uh, simple form uh, involving the, uh, uh, there's not dropped in the next term, I think, when I take the Fourier transform. Um, so this is the, still a time dependent expression which involves uh, propagation of uh, what should have been up here is uh, just the energy eigenvalue. Uh, no, I'm, I, 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 I take it back. Uh, I'm going to retract what I just said. There's something a little bit subtle right here. Um, even though we've defined that as the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian, there is still all the electronic coordinates. And when you integrate over the electronic coordinates, you get the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian that you normally think of, the one that acts on the nuclei in the jth electronic state. And so we still have, that's how we created uh, this term. So this is correct. And this op operates on the phonon coordinate dependence to its right, if you wish. Uh, so here is an eigenstate of the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian in some electronic state. Its eigenstateness remains, if I approximate this by a constant, I just get a constant time that eigenstate. But if I have coordinate dependence, you can think of a power series in C in different coordinates, different phonon modes, then that turns this, this is like A daggers, it's going to create phonons. And it happens before you ever start propagating, before you ever start thinking about electron-phonon scattering. 
That happens here. And we won't even worry about it for a reason I'll tell you. Um, the main mistake we believe uh, in the whole business was to focus on what seems so alluring. Oh yeah, we excited the electron and now what's going to happen? Electron phonon scattering. Well, what if, what if I told you, well, at the very least you shouldn't ignore the contribution to phonons made here. And then, uh, well, I'll explain why that term in the case of extended uh, electronic states like we find in graphene at least, uh, really doesn't do much. So we can define a renormalized state, which is no longer an eigenstate, which is just mu times the state. And uh, that's the transition dipole moment again. Uh, and then when we, when we have Fourier transform it, we bring down the, uh, I, we, we insert a complete set of states of these, which are the Born-Oppenheimer eigenstates. And, uh, they, of course, appear in denominators, and the square appears. Or we can uh, leave it in the time domain. And let me just go back. Uh, leaving it in the time domain uh, says, take this state and propagate it on the Born-Oppenheimer potential surface J and project it onto the state living uh, down in the initial state. And um, this is a task which may be tens of orders of magnitude easier than trying to follow, to find all the eigenstates uh, at all energies and all electronic states. Instead, you have a given wave function, a function of phonons, and uh, it may be on several elect uh, electronic Born-Oppenheimer surfaces. On each one, it's a wave packet. And the wave packet's just going to move and needs to be projected onto here. And I am try to remind you that, uh, on the slide coming up, how short time Raman scattering is. Um, so you could follow this overlap between wave packets for a short time. Uh, in molecular spectroscopy, when you have, here I've shown only two coordinates, but you could have 20, uh, what you've done to do Raman scattering is you've promoted a wave packet. Here we have only one excited potential energy surface. It's not in an equilibrium position in general. Starts to fly downhill and uh, overlaps various excited states down here on its way out in this case. And you can understand Raman spectroscopy in an instant without finding the, you're told in standard Cromer-Heisenberg-Dirac, oh, sorry, uh, go away for six months and find all the scattering states at, at a lot of different energies for this potential. Or you can go away for six days and uh, do a fast Fourier transform propagation of a wave packet and get exactly the same answer when you uh, have Fourier transforming. Um, this is just a side comment. We're not going to do this. Um, let's see if we agree on all these statements. I hope, I hope we do. Without the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, we can't speak of crystal structure, phonons, and electronic states. Uh, the electronic state, let's suppose we have a vibration in just one phonon state to make things simple, and the others are quiescent. Uh, we go out and we go back. Um, I think people's mouth water and, ah, electron photon scattering is, could happen. But that would be Born Oppenheimer breakdown. In a Born Oppenheimer approximation, whenever the nuclei are back where they started, we are back in the same electronic state. So if you want to speak of electron photon scattering, you're speaking of breakdown of Born Oppenheimer.
Uh, usually Raman scattering lasts femtoseconds or less. Uh, the, the, the simplest case uh, is a dis photo dissociation if the molecule just comes apart. That takes a few femtoseconds and the Raman scattering is over and all the light that's emitted is emitted on the way out. Um, but interestingly, you might think that, ah, oh, that must mean that you get broad lines, right? It's, it's such a short time. But you don't, because the arithmetic, you get perfectly sharp lines, as sharp as your lasers, and they, uh, or as sharp as the, uh, you know, if you've got some broadening going on down here, because your, your, your molecule's colliding, uh, that would be different. But let's suppose it's isolated and nice, sharp, well-defined eigenstates, and here's your incident laser below resonance as it happens to be with the next set of levels in another electronic state. Uh, it emits in a Stokes Raman classic way to a different uh, vibrational state down here in the lowest electronic state. Um, how is that going to broaden? This state has a definite energy. Uh, this had a definite energy going in. You know the energy of your laser. So there's no intermediate energies to go to. So the Raman scattering is perfectly sharp. And if I change the incident laser frequency, it remains perfectly sharp. Of course, the emitted Stokes line uh, gets bluer because it's coming from a higher point. But, but I know how much I've increased the length of this arrow. And so I notice this, 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 line, this uh, band is exactly at the same energy it was before, even though I changed the laser energy, because I can do the subtraction. Um, so I've been talking about the transition moment a lot already. And here it is, let's say, looks something like that. It isn't a constant. So we multiply it by the initial wave function and get something like this dashed line. Typically, they would be uh, in the excited electronic state, a different set of forces on the nuclei and uh, a different potential. So we'd have both effects of the, uh, ch the transition moment not being constant, which gives us a slight change in shape of the wave function. Uh, not radical, because this is dying exponential, so, so you can't really do much to this wave function except the kind of thing I've drawn there. And also this displacement, which is going to uh, mean, in a time-dependent sense, this red dashed line wave pack is going to start sloshing back and forth. And as it does, we can compute its overlap with various ground state wave functions, also distorted by this, and we would have the Raman scattering. And this is going to be important, even if there was exactly the same potential energy surface uh, above us, just displaced vertically in energy, but otherwise the same shape, the same minimum, uh, we'd still have the change in transition moment, caused by the transition moment to deal with. Both of these uh, effects, the displacement and the change in shape, correspond, if you will allow me, because this is hardly a phonon to talk about vibration in one dimension, but you know it is the antecedent of phonons. If you keep adding more and more nuclei, these vibrations are going to become phonons. So I'm claiming that even the displacement as well as the transition dipole, they are both, they both correspond to instantaneous, upon photoabsorption, creation of phonons. There is a kind of electron-phonon coupling. This is going to slide downhill and gain speed. Isn't that electron-phonon coupling? Well, it is. But uh, this is just a phonon going back and forth, if you wish, that happens to have been born at the extreme of its motion. It's just going to go back and forth. And whatever electronic energy you lose, you regain. That's not electron-phonon scattering. If there were another electronic state and you crossed over and went over here somewhere, that's electron phonon scattering. That's the breakdown of Born Oppenheimer. 
So if you have this uh, transition moment, you could expand it in a power series. This is not perturbation theory, because uh, you just have some polynomial-like thing which looks like the transition moment. And you could decide one day it's convenient to expand it in a polynomial. You have not, you've not computed any of these terms by uh, these coefficients. Whoops. You have not computed any of these coefficients by um, perturbation theory. You've actually, let's say, used a computer to find uh, the transition moment as a function of nuclear coordinate, and you're taking derivatives. Uh, which, by the way, I think comes into why the, this, this coming controversy is, is there, because Falakoff's paper dates from the early 80s and there were, there were antecedents. Uh, one, one didn't have much uh, in the way of computation power, and when there had been so many successes in other fields of condensed matter physics with condensed matter, with many body perturbation theory, he set out to apply it to this excited uh, state of photoabsorption. But eventually, you, you re expand these uh, phonon coordinates in terms of collections of phonon modes. And uh, they are excited compared to the, if we started in the ground state, you have some excited states now with phonons just by multiplying the transition moment times the initial wave function before any propagation or time evolves on the excited potential surface. So what's the key in the final line? Uh, the first term on the right-hand side of the final line is the key. <laughs> I, just, I, I just kind of... Zero Q. I'm sorry, that should be C. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cut and paste typo. Uh, that's a, uh, a lack of a back. Thank you. So now, but okay. The without the phone, if there were no phonons, <clears throat> we would only have that first term. I mean, is the, the standard approach? Yes, the standard approach is to treat this as a constant. That's the end of the series, right there. No phonons. So each of these, a kj, kj prime, in addition to the psi, those are really, uh, those, those are phonon momenta, is that? Well, is that what? they are phonons, yes. Yeah, I mean, they Which have momenta, generally. Right, I mean, you're labeling the phonon states. Right. And um, so you get upstairs with those things, with those phonons. Will you get downstairs and emit light of a different frequency and reveal that those phonons exist, that's a different matter. And that depends upon electron hole pair mechanics and getting, you know, now some of these phonons have momentum and they kick the electron, which no longer fits its hole. And something has to happen to make the electron want to repair with the hole. There can also be hole scattering, but we're going to simplify matters today. Uh, so let's look at this polyacetylene issue. This is what was dealt with uh, 35 years ago. Um, there's polyacetylene, which is, uh, you know, a conjugated hydrocarbon, and the even though these double bonds are here, they're pretty weak, uh, and the electrons are known to be delocalized. Uh, the valence electrons, you have p orbitals sticking up out of the board here, and uh, they all communicate with each other in delocalized uh, electronic states. Uh, there is pyrrole distortion, and there's slightly shorter bonds in um, every other uh, bond. But if you look at off resonant Raman scattering, way below the first uh, absorption, way below the pyrroles gap, energy, you see just these two lines at the two different frequencies, about 1114 something. And we're going to focus on these two um, today. Uh, and 
And here's the absorption spectrum for polyacetylene and uh, labeled by a few different uh, frequencies or nanometers. And this is the spectrum of polyacetylene uh, at 576.4 nanometers right here, well into the absorption spectrum. And there have been hardly any changes far off resonance. Remember the rule for Raman scattering far off resonance is the line strengths are proportional to the square of the derivative of the polarizability with respect to nuclear, with respect to that phonon coordinate. And here's one thing I should have mentioned earlier. If the transition moments were actually constant, then the expression for that polarizability would be zero. You need the coordinate dependence. If you do the sum for the polarizability, you have to sum over all the excited electronic states, take a derivative with respect to uh, phonon coordinate. And if all of these mu's I've been talking about, as is approximation universally made in condensed matter theory, were taken to be constant, you'd get a big fat zero for that result. So they have to depend on nuclear coordinates. Um, so something is very much the same, off resonant as on resonant, and only as you go up in, in bluer and bluer light you're applying to the sample, some interesting things start to happen. These lines broaden considerably and then split, and you get these uh, funny sharp peaks uh, which are moving to the right as you go bluer and bluer. What are those taken? The blue light one? Uh, when were they taken? Yeah. About 1982. But the blue light, blue light laser wasn't invented until the 90s or something, right? They probably had time They had something. Yeah. Because there's, there's dozens of papers with this uh, 457 in it. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you look at that third one, you notice that these lines are starting to break through uh, at lower energy. You can even sort of extract their peaks because of the asymmetry of this line. Uh, and so you have to understand why is this uh, blue shifted Raman band appearing? Why is it unlike Raman bands normally do? Why is it shifting its frequency? Remember, we said even if you shift the Raman line, uh, the incident uh, laser energy, the Raman line position doesn't shift. Here it's shifting. However, this is a crystal, uh, a one dimensional crystal. And there's a lot more modes there than one. And so it ain't impossible that the, the modes that are getting excited are different at different uh, Raman intensities. But the buzz at the time was that the samples were lousy. Um, people. The main theory out there was that there were some effectively short polymers of polyacetylene and long ones. And the short ones would tend to resonate more in the blue by particle in the box models and light up when you went to blue light. And, and that would show as a shifted band. And when you went to even bluer light, you'd find even shorter polymers that were ready to go. And uh, that was the, and that's what you're seeing stated here and here and uh, there and there. It was all over the place. So if you look at the three <laughs> pictures, would it be fair to say that at the, at the bottom picture, the approximation of just keeping the A naught term might still be okay, but that 
you have difficulty going to these newer lights when there's more energy that can create more phonons? Um, there's some limit. I, I, I know. I believe that the transition moments are causing these intensities here and off resonance. Oh. So even step one, you say you can't get right. Even right. step one. Modes are the 1100, 1500. I'm sorry. I'm curious what the Raman modes are. 1100, 1500. Yeah, I got I got pictures of them. Uh, well, no, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't have pictures of them. Um, I'm thinking of the graphene, so I'm going to have to describe it. Uh, they're very similar looking carbon carbon stretch modes, uh, which, um, which are. Uh, didn't I have a picture of graphene up here? I mean, of uh, polyacetylene. Where uh, you were? Up to me. There it is. So uh, the mode, which is close to 1500, is mostly C double bond C stretching uh, with some out of phase CC stretching. In other words, when the one goes in, out, the, the single bond goes in. And uh, uh, the other one at lower frequency uh, involves changing both bond lengths, but you see a lot of uh, uh, flattening of the zigzag as the carbon comes down and up, the central carbon there in the, in the top row. So I want to make key point number one. Um, I don't know why this isn't, uh, this, this is where we could be crazy point number one too, but uh, we, have su we have support in the literature and it seems physically very correct. There is no interaction change, no Born-Oppenheimer potential surface change upon creation of a delocalized electron hole pair in a crystal. I have 10 to the 20th of whatever electrons. I change one of them, and all 10 to the 20th are delocalized over the whole crystal, making the effective Born-Oppenheimer potential what it is. And you're telling me that one electron is going to change all that and cause big shifts in nuclear positions and things? The nuclear positions are exactly the same and the shape of the potential is exactly the same after the electron hole pair has been created. And uh, there's lots of evidence for this if you look for it. Uh, here's longer and longer conjugated uh, benzene rings and they're looking at something called reorganization energy which is how, how far, how much energy does the excited state have to lose once it's created up there in the excited state. Well, if there's a lot of displacement, uh, it's got a lot of energy it can lose. That's the reorganization energy, that red arrow. But they're finding it going down and down and down as the uh, uh, molecule gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And what's happening is the, one, the single electron that you're making into an electron hole pair is delocalized over the whole system and its effect is diluted uh, and any one benzene ring and its uh, effect is going to zero. It's not quite that simple. You have to do a little bit more work to show that um, uh, not just the individual uh, bond coordinates aren't affected, but that even the phonons aren't correct. Collective coordinates like phonons aren't affected. The so-called wang reese factor goes to zero. And this has been done uh, for large conjugated oligomers. There you see again the reorganization energy going to zero. You can't really imagine 
the reorganization energy being zero and there being any change in the potential. So you're stuck with this. Um, and you've heard me say this before, the key point number two, you can't safely ignore the coordinate dependent of the transition moment. But I'm, I'm going to go back to this for a second. Um, so I said they froze the transition moments and started worrying about the dynamics on the excited state surface, um, which within Born-Oppenheimer at least is nil. The wave packet's born, except for these distortions due to the transition moment, it's born, which they don't have because they froze it. Uh, they're doing a perturbation theory on exactly nothing. There's no motion up there. Well, I'll take that back. Their perturbation theory, if they continued it, would be many body perturbation theory and actually doesn't depend upon the Born Oppenheimer assumption. So uh, they're, they're doing perturbation theory on something which in Born Oppenheimer is exactly zero. Um, and now there's experimental evidence. Uh, experimentalists found that uh, the, the Condon approximation simply will not explain the, ex the experiments they're getting in carbon nanotubes. I won't explain uh, their reasoning, but uh, there's evidence out there. And I want to give a, a simple model for uh, the polyacetylene. Uh, if we, uh, uh, we're going to, just try to understand uh, the spectrum based uh, mainly on the simple model. Uh, the mathematics agrees with it, but takes longer and is somehow even less convincing. So let's start with this. The ground state of polyacetylene, and we're looking at p orbitals from the top down. So we're the uh, opposite signed bottom part of the p orbital is hidden from us. And uh, the ground state is uh, q equals zero state, which has all positive uh, signs on the orbitals and uh, is totally bonding. But if we start to move up in energy, uh, we have block waves forming on this pattern and places where the uh, amplitude of the orbitals is very small nodes and then it switches sign. And a uh, block wave vector Q, which is the, time, the distance it takes to recover its uh, one wavelength. And then you get shorter and shorter wavelengths until the top of the band, uh, you have everything is still always bonding on the double bonds. But uh, as anti-bonding as it can be on the single bonds. And that's the highest occupied molecular orbital. The lowest uh, unoccupied molecular orbital also have the same Q. And I could use your help with this. Uh, my students and I keep debating this. Uh, this is sometimes called Q equals X. It's clearly not the same as this Q equals zero, but in some sense, it's Q equals zero, right? Because there's no block vector here. Or you could say the block vector is very short. But if you extend the unit cell by one unit, now you really have a K equals zero state up here. Is that what the way people think about it? Uh, Well, because uh, we want to, for example, photons have no uh, momentum, and we've got to go from uh, the same k between the states of the same k. And it's just convenient to call this k equals zero, and this is also k equals zero. That's the <laughs> that that's homo lumo transition, but. Um, we're going to be thinking more about, oh, and I should say more about the excited state. Um, every single state in the excited state is made of anti-bonding combinations on the double bonds. And they start out with all bonding on the single bonds. Now, the fact that this uh, pyro's gap exists, those should be the same energy if, if it wasn't for the fact that there's, the double bonds are closer than the single bonds. And so it costs you energy to trade anti-bonding character because it's more repulsive to have close uh, anti-phased orbitals uh, than it is to have 
distant antiphased orbitals. And so you have this gap here. Uh, but this is also a k equals zero state. But we're going to consider uh, going from some state k equals q to some other state k equals q. So we're going to do mid-band transition. And we're going to do it by um, the spirals gap. Um, I just wanted to show you uh, this, these simple pictures I've been plotting of the orbitals is not too far from the truth. This is a calculation I did in Gaussian, uh, which is a quantum chemistry program. Uh, I constructed that length of polyacetylene, which is pretty darn short compared to some of the experiments, but it's still you know, what I could handle on my Mac. And um, uh, this is the uh, uh, highest, uh, th this is the uh, highest occupied molecular orbital. Uh, of course, it has to go to zero at the ends, but you see it's all bonding uh, on the double bonds and anti-bonding on the single bonds and the vice versa on the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And that's a that's a that's a density functional theory calculation. So, in focusing on these two midband this this midband transition, uh, we're going to gray out the others to keep them out of our sight, and we're thinking about it at a photon uh, like this, taking us up here, and we notice that. Uh, we're going to be multiplying by a transition dipole operator, which we're going to take to be uh, pointing in the y direction, more or less, or if you like, along these double bonds. Uh, so what happens when I take the, the initial electronic wave function, multiply by the transition moment operator, which is y, basically, I change this, this uh, mismatched sign here, I have plus plus, I change this this uh, minus to a plus with the y operator. And so when I do the integral with the dipole operator sandwiched in between, in this region at least, I get all plus pluses and I get a positive contribution. Uh, then I get very little because I have this uh, region of low amplitude. What happens here? Well, this is minus minus and it meets a minus plus, but again the transition operator will take it to plus now up here. And again, we have minus, minus times minus, minus. Everything's plus, And uh, we get another positive contribution. So the transition dipole that we're getting, uh, the constant part, is waxing and waning in strength. It's small in strength where there's very little amplitude in either orbital. Uh, and largest in strength where the amplitudes are largest. And um, You'll notice that it's at oscillating as the square of the red oscillation, which is the Q of the um, electronic state. That means the wavelength of this is 2Q momentum. Momentum is 2Q, not wavelength. Um, and uh, that's interesting. And also, there's a DC component, because the transition moment is never zero. Doesn't go negative. And uh, I have to write this as 1 plus cosine squared of 2Q, basically, 2QX. The 1 means something. That's the term that takes me to the high symmetry gamma points that you learn about in condensed matter spectroscopy the k equals zero band. Uh, now I want to tell you why the transition moment changes a lot. If we just start with a single, single carbon bond, a single uh, carbon bond, it could be a single or double carbon bond, but here you have the, the bond and, and uh, we have the antiphased orbital before we multiplied by the transition moment. We're going to say this is one of the uh, Phonon coordinates are just a coordinate now which is describing the distance between these two nuclei. Uh, I have two diagrams here because there is the uh, valence and conduction band to worry about. And they start out uh, overlap of zero. But I multiply by x, I flip the sign of this one, I do the integral and I get a nice positive sign. 
Well, suppose I were to move them apart and again multiply by x. The same sign change happens, but I get a larger integral proportional to x. Because I haven't drawn it in, but this x is bigger out here and, and smaller down here. And the integral is involving two small things here and two bigger things here. And you get a transition moment which is proportional to the distance between the nuclei. And the, um, the general rule of thumb is, at least for a, a bond in a molecule, that a 10% change in bond length gives you about a 10% change in transition moment. That's a, that's a typical rule. Uh, you do have to worry, well, what happens to this in the case of uh, now it's diluted over an entire crystal. Um, well, it can't go away because if it did, again, we have this problem with no polarizability of the, the whole system. And what you can show is, yes, it does get diluted, this one, uh, the strength you get from one bond. But it's actually, if you, if you look over all transitions in both bands, you get the strength back of one bond's worth of transition dipole variation. And then you realize you have n of these, not just one, that have this strength. And now you're in business. You've got plenty of dipole strength. So how does the Raman strength of, of these polyacetylenes compare to if I just had a, uh, you know, a bath of diatomic molecules with a typical the there I would expect to be. You know, I wish I knew the answer to that. It turns out that Raman scatter uh, experimentalists are incredibly reluctant to quote you absolute Raman intensities. Uh, there are factors of millions lying around. Sure. You get a million times more, well, a hundred thousand times more Rayleigh scattering um, than you do yeah, Raman. But the same, you know, relative to another sample. Yeah, so it's hard to compare even the same sample at different frequencies in absolute terms. All of the pictures I have, maybe they're doing better today, but they show the Raman intensities in arbitrary units. Um, so the scenario for making a k equals zero phonon uh, is also produced instantly with the same probability each time and is due to the DC part of the transition moment variation. It gives, since it's k equals zero, there's no kick to the electron, and the electron is instantly ready to combine with its hole. Uh, there is no electron photon scattering needed. Uh, the k equals zero bands are as steady as a rock as conditions are changed, and conditions will include length of the molecule, a laser frequency, and indeed, uh, we'll see that again when I show some of the spectra in some of the experiments that were done. Um, the scenario for k equals 2q. The photons absorbed, the 2q photon that is produced instantly with the same probability each time. Momentum conservation means the electron has been kicked backwards with the same energy as before from q to minus q but it's now in no shape to uh, combine with the hole. And you need elastic backscattering to match the hole momentum, and you, or else you won't see uh, that k equals 2, 2, 2q phonon has been produced. It'll be there, but you won't notice it in the spectrum, the Raman spectrum. Uh, still no electron phonon scattering is involved. Uh, here's the phonon band structure, and if you do get k equals 2q phonons, those are the two bands we've been looking at, the 1,000 or so wave number band and the 1,400, the 1400 or so wave number band. Both uh, energies, band energies, go up with, uh, with q, and so that immediately explains why these funny tent-shaped peaks uh, continue to move away from the k equals zero peak as, as light energies increase because we go to higher q 
we go further along to the right in this band structure diagram, in those two modes, we go up in frequency, and that means bigger shift from k equals zero, which is down there at the bottom. So we've explained the, and it's a quantitative fit, we've explained the positions of the tent-shaped peaks, uh, the, the so-called phonon sideband, the so-called uh, sidebands, uh, in terms of the phonon dis band structure dispersion. Uh, before I show you that dispersion, I want to show you two other experiments that are done at fixed frequency. Um, remember we said backscattering was required for the k equals 2q to be produced. Well, um, this is an experiment that was done uh, late in the game. Uh, there were very few references to it because the field was winding down. By the way, the field wound down with no explanation of the Raman scattering uh, 35 years ago. Um, and they, they getting tired of uh, people claiming poly, uh, you know, uh, samples with many lengths of, uh, in them, they actually quantitatively produced a bunch with length 3,800 monomers, uh, 400 and 200. And then they took the spectrum and saw uh, the shorter it was, the more k equals 2q sideband they got, all at 47 or 457. And that makes perfect sense from our point of view. Um, let's suppose uh, you have to be within some distance uh, of the end, or you won't make it before some other relaxation process takes place to backscatter. So, so it's quite simple that the um, uh, shorter, one, shorter poly, uh, polymers are going to have more of the electrons that you excite available to ends and you get more backscattering and higher intensity in the uh, phonon sidebands. And here's this rock solid k equals zero. I'll show you later why both have width and what this width is due to. But you see, it's not changing in its position. It's not changing in its shape as we change uh, this length. Uh, and here's another person who got tired of the literature and said, well, I'm going to put defects in and we'll see what, what they do. And so at 457, again, this group uh, had 0% defects. That's a bit of a misleading because there certainly is some percentage of defects uh, in any sample of polyacetylene, but they meant 0% that they added by oxidizing the sample, 4.5%, 7%, 13%. So these defects can elastically backscatter electrons, and you see this phonon sideband intensity growing uh, dramatically as they add more defects. Uh, now, the laser wavelength dependence. Um, at long wavelength, there's almost no phonon sideband, then it starts to grow and move uh, to the right. And uh, using this phonon dispersion curve, we drew arrows where we think the peak should be as a function of laser frequency, and they're right on with the, with the phonon dispersion curve. This was never explained before. There was one paper that tried to say it was k equals q, not 2q, but it didn't work, of course. Um, why, though, uh, and this is maybe the weakest point, um, we have some preliminary calculations in Gaussian that show that uh, higher, uh, uh, shorter wavelength electronic states, higher Q, do tend to backscatter more from impurities. But we've only tried one or two impurities. And uh, it's hardly a complete study. But if that were true, uh, that explains there's more backscattering with, uh, with, with shorter wavelength, and that would explain the extra intensity here. But I would say that's the weakest point in our evidence so far. But the shift in position is not, uh, n uh, not in doubt. Uh, this is some of our, uh, this is a silicon atom in place of carbon, and at, at a long wavelength, uh, 
uh, sorry, at short wavelength, you get more backscattering than at long wavelength. These are some of the uh, phonon modes with uh, two silicons in place. And they tend to be very badly disturbed by the existence of a mass defect. Uh, these are numerical simulations. Uh, a lot of this is, has to do with uh, frequencies and Fourier transforms. And if you suppose you have domains that exist between defects, then k is no longer an exactly good quantum number. And um, you have the possibility of moving off the precise k equals 0, precise k equals 2q line. So I set up a model in which um, I took that into account and started adding up uh, where the bands would be. And it, I couldn't stop until I reached about 3,000 trials of different positions of the impurities. Otherwise, it was too noisy. And then I got these figures um, with weak backscattering, modest backscattering, and strong backscattering, which look a heck of a lot like the experiments. So let's get on to graphene quickly. Um, the Martin Falikoff paper, which was so um, influential, starts off with the same place I did. Uh, he did it 30 years earlier uh, with a many body description of um, Raman scattering. Uh, but then he passes to this expression. Well, that's fine. That's just a Fourier transform of this. You don't know anything about these many body. Uh, terms. But then the paths diverge radically uh, that they took and that we take. Um, the term MJI is an unknown perturbative matrix element connecting unknown excited states. Uh, some electron phonon, if you wish, uh, pro process. And there are first order processes and second order processes that they need. Uh, this is mostly what they need, and this is, makes the whole theory fourth order, whereas Raman scattering theory to every uh, molecular spectroscopist is thought of as second order. Um, and here's another thing that's really strange. Uh, this sort of blew me away. So Falikoff says, well, here's the perturbation series. Oops, some of the terms, the denominators go to zero. So rather than saying, ah, perturbation theory doesn't work or we can't use the terms, he says, good, we found important terms in the process. And, uh, you know, I was told to run away from perturbation series that blew up. <laughs> but uh, this is very bold. And um, it uh, was, was picked up by a huge community of people. So actually, the funny thing is, if you do a little calculation on your computer, and you have a, a state and a manifold of states, and you can have several manifold of states all coupled to each other in groups, one manifold to the next, and you start in the first state, and you integrate the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, um, and watch the populations in the various levels, the exactly degenerate states almost never dominate the process. I mean, you got bands. You got golden rule widths with any reasonable coupling. And the one state doesn't get all of the. You'd have to have an incredibly weak coupling before only the degenerate state would, would garner all of the. It had to be coupling weaker than the energy level spacing, which is infinitesimal between adjacent states. So otherwise, this degenerate state uh, this, this, the, it doesn't even get most of the probability. So this is, this is, this is kind of a strange argument, I think. Because of one hour ago, I just told my student the opposite. They only asked me questions. So that. Same question? Yeah, basically. Well, similar. But, uh, um, figure it out. <laughs> OK, well, let's. Uh, finish up quickly. I've gone over, I think. Um, 
DR. Pardon me? The previous slide, you said DR says, this. who's DR? Oh, these are the double resonance folks. And double resonance means two zero denominators. Um, One of the problems with their theory is that the fixing the transition moments means that the electron arrives upstairs carrying the full photon energy. Now that's a problem, actually. Um, we believe they should have applied perturbation theory to the ends of this expression, the transition moments, not to the middle. Uh, let me get to the, uh, you've all seen this for graphene. I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen the Raman spectrum for graphene. It's incredibly simple. And most of the problem is explaining why it's so simple. Um, if you mess up graphene with defects, you get a few more lines. Um, but I'm running out of time. There's some modes pictured there. And here's the graphene phonon dispersion curve. And this one I like because it has a double degeneracy here at the K point. We believe it exists. The reason we believe it exists is that everybody uh, no, I can't be right. I saw the picture. Everybody plots this as the mode, uh, an A1G mode, uh, at the K point, a vibrational mode with all with uh, a, a super lattice of hexagons, uh, breathing perfectly symmetrically in and out. One paper claims that this has to exist by symmetry. Um, other papers don't seem to quite get this mode, uh, which is itself a mystery, because they should have at least got the symmetry right. But anyway, um, what struck us is, who picked that hexagon to be breathing? Why not this one? This one doesn't uh, vibrate the same way that one does. So the symmetry is broken in this mode. So we believe that there are two of these modes. Actually, you can think of three, but my graduate student showed that the third one is, is, is linearly dependent on the first two. So we believe this is a doubly degenerate mode, at least tentatively, and at least uh, unless one of you has a reason, and I'd be very willing to accept this, why that's not right. But so far, we haven't found the reason. Coloring. If you, if you color the, the graph, you have a lot of triangle tessellation uh, colors, and, and then you say, well, the red node's green, and then I say, well, the blue node's green. So, how many colors do you use? Well, uh, it looks like three are needed, but uh, the two, the, one of the three is, 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 uh, is linearly dependent. <laughs> There are three classes of uh, places you can. In other words, there are three super lattices you can make um, out of this pattern by coloring. The super lattice is, is uh, the pattern you see of the breathing modes. Um, now here's this. Uh, D line, which you see when it's a messy sample, the 2D line is always there, um, changing its position with excitation energy, while the G line, which is a gamma point mode, high symmetry mode, coming in our, from our point of view from the constant term in the transition moment, is rock solid and doesn't uh, change position. Uh, there's a so this is, this is what, uh, I could have started with this. This is a one page in the catalog of fourth order processes which the double resonance people use to describe various ways they can produce lines that exist. And they don't talk much about lines that don't exist. And my reaction was, it can't be this bad. And what's more, what really bothered me and there's never a word about this. Here's a fourth order process. Uh, these are the direct cones uh, around which you work when you use uh, 
light of that frequency um, from the uh, valence band to the conduction band filled to empty. And you go up with this phot phonon. Um, you emit back to the ground state with a red-shifted photon. But where's the hole that has this length? And then, by good fortune, I guess it's double resonance terms exist for this process, you scatter two phonons, because the 2D line has two phonons. So most of these graphs have emission processes that don't match the whole. Why? Because they came up with, this, with the phonon, uh, with a photon energy equaling the electron energy and no pho phonon. So it, when they create a phonon, they lose electron energy. And now you don't have the right energy to go back down to the hole. This is uh, not mentioned. When we go up with the transition moment, everything is created right at the beginning. The total energy equals the photon energy, including the energy of the phonons. So the electronic energy is exactly right to go back down to the hole. Also, since they're working in fourth order, they basically are cataloging processes that are fourth order, and they have a book. And the book has empty entries, uh, missing lines, which they don't say much about. Uh, and I, I just, um, I need either, either to be put away, or I, I'm just flabbergasted that a whole community of physicists doesn't, actually doesn't <laughs> criticize itself. Why doesn't one young person say, hey, what about this? We can't explain that. There's lots of stuff that doesn't make sense. But instead, um, it's a phenomenon which I'm afraid is getting a little more common in physics of this is the story that was decided before you came along, or you're not in the field and you're coming in, get on the bus or get left behind. Do you know what I'm talking about? That's not really. <laughs> but is it becoming more prevalent, or do you think it's the same rate as before? That's very hard to understand. Hard to you say. Have to do a double-blind study. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this funny diagram for the electron-hole pair. Uh, for some reason, they shift to a local process, uh, and here's this lightning bolt where I guess the uh, process happens, even though we should think of it over large areas of the whole crystal. And they separate from each other, uh, traveling in opposite directions. And now, through some miracle, they sometimes find each other and recombine. Uh, the problem with this, from the point of view of most Raman scattering, is it takes, even if it happens, it's way too long before this happens, Raman scattering is over. Uh, I'll just finish with a couple of slides. I won't, I won't describe this because it's, uh, there's our picture. <laughs> um, if you insist on a local creation, I think it's better to think of it as a delocalized creation. Um, we, uh, for the 2D process, our transition moment has two powers of the phonon in it, and it instantly creates oppositely traveling phonons, imparts no momentum, therefore, to the electron, and it's immediately ready to recombine with its hole. And in the terms of their uh, Dirac Cohen pictures, things are much simpler, and there's only a few diagrams. Um, and electrons go up, uh, create their phonons, uh, this is a k equals zero phonon with no wiggles. This is a k equals two q phonon, a single one, which needs to backscatter to, to go back down. But when it goes back down, it fits exactly its hole. And here is a 2D line, two phonons created instantly, and it's instantly ready without backscattering to go back down. Uh, 
So we made this progress, and um, I mentioned it enough. I don't really have to. That's that's actually not. Uh, I wanted to stop there. But thank you and the Della Pietra family. So are you going to call the white coats, or are you going to? Uh, yes. So can you do a, a born oppenheimer calculation on graphene and reproduce the Raman spectra of graphene like you did for polyacetylene then? Uh, yes, we'd like to. Um, it should be possible uh, using uh, the right density functional theory code. Um, we are not quantum chemists. We're supposed to be dynamicists. And it's hard to get my students to do it. So we're looking for a collaborator who does that kind of calculation. Is there anybody? Mm -hmm. um, because it turns out you can't do that on your Mac. Is that because it's two-dimensional as opposed to one-dimensional? It's just harder? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you know, you, you can, can supposed to be able to do it uh, using um, just one unit cell, which has just two atoms in it. Um, but it turns out when you try to calculate transition moments, yeah. you find that most of the codes don't have the facility to tra calculate transition moments, except rather crudely. Yeah. In Gaussian, there's something called cube gen. And the cubes they use to pl plot the orbitals, you can get a hold of that data. Um, I don't know if it's as accurate as it should be. But uh, it, will be, it will be possible. So, yeah. uh, do solitons in polycyclic play any role at all in the quantum experiment? Well, if you look back in the literature in the 80s, uh, people were seeing the solitons everywhere. But it kind of died out by the 90s, and the last papers didn't seem to. I mean, people did. There's even one paper that, that blamed these sidebands on solitons. Um, I didn't quite see the argument, and it didn't, didn't catch on. It's just one paper. Um, but um, I think they're, uh, they certainly must exist. And, uh, but if, and they, might, they might represent these defects. It's possible. Maybe they're not kinks. Maybe they're not um, uh, uh, you know, the wrong atom sitting somewhere. Maybe maybe it's a soliton. I don't think it would look too good if, if a soliton, you know, if to the electronic state, if, if, if suddenly, well, if you think about scattering theory, if you came up to a soliton, do you think you'd backscatter? Either phonon or electron? Well, not for sure. Not for sure. We should probably consider that. Have we tried modeling with other kinds of defects in the polyassembly polymer? Yeah, we did try. Um, the oxygenation uh, is the only other thing we tried. And you get uh, um, some kind of carbonyl or something sitting in the, in the middle. and. Uh, that, that caused a much heavier perturbation of, of the, both the phonons and the electron than, than just replacing a carbon by a silicon. I was surprised at how the, the, you know, I can't think of a, except for C13 by C14, which is, which is there anyway to some extent. Uh, silicon is a pretty meager defect, I think, but it still causes quite dramatic effects. So if you imagine an experiment that you could do to kind of clarify, because it seems that you have a totally different picture in terms of your accounting of momentum, what kind of experiment would just nail that this is the right picture? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Thank you. In the polyacetylene, um, the k equals zero band, that red sort of triangle band, is is produced without kicking the electron backwards, and it's ready to go and combine with its hole immediately. 
the K equals 2Q band needs to backscatter. So we believe in a time-dependent uh, pulse experiment, we would see that the sideband come up uh, later than the, uh, the elastic band. So the two yeah. questions. Two. I, I'm just a little bit confused by your statement saying that the coupling isn't strongest between the nearly degenerate states or the, you know, the one I think of, you know, okay, of course, I'm not in the United States, right? But if I think of my, my bright states, the energy isn't strongest between the bright state and the states that are nearly degenerate. But I guess it's sort of. The coupling isn't strongest between the. Degenerate states? Yeah, I mean, you're saying, you know, if you do some calculation and you start in this state and then you have some whole manifold, the degenerate states aren't the most important. Which I'm not. That's sort of. Oh, you mean the, the calculation I described? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've got a. <laughs> or maybe I. I uh... Uh, well, it's a calculation you all have seen a hundred times, uh, but I, I, I wasn't clear. Is there a way to get one of these up? So if you go back to your office, in 11 minutes you'll have this calculation done. Pick an a initial state, an exactly degenerate state, and then a bunch of other states. And recognizing that this is incredibly small, distance and it's absurd to think the coupling is less than that distance. Okay. Then you'll get uh, a spectrum of occupation like this and, and this might be the exactly degenerate state. But it's still stronger than one's way far away. Yes. Oh sure. Sure. And it's true, they have in their defense, um, with only one in 10 million photons winding up as Raman scattering, they can waste a lot. And without any absolute Raman scattering cross-sections, maybe they could. But you're saying it's ridiculous to pick out just one term in that. The adjacent ones you wouldn't expect to be. Great. Yeah, these, these adjacent ones could be creating entirely the wrong uh, backscattering or, or, or the wrong phonon. Um, would, Lots of, by the way, it's very interesting to think there's zillions of phonons that could be created upstairs and just swimming around up there, but they've done the wrong thing to the electron, which will now never find its way back down. So it'd be nice to know, in fact, the total absorption cross-section is many orders of magnitude larger than the Raman scattering or even the Rayleigh scattering. So I think the upstairs is loaded with phonons there are just very few that can ever do, uh, find the, the right elastic backscattering or other process to, to get back down. It'd be nice to do an experiment, thinking of experiments, to show the presence of all the other phonons. Why don't we stop here and thank our speaker? Thank you.